have your Bibles this morning, and I, I hope that you do, open them with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. So uh, this, this time of year, this Advent season as we're preparing to celebrate Christmas, it's not just about getting our shopping done, it's not just about making sure everything is decorated the right way, it, we're, we're taking time to look to God's Word and In particular, the book of Isaiah and what it says about Messiah who was to come. So if if you remember or you know Isaiah, this prophet spoke about a thousand years before Christ came. So every promise that is made about the coming Messiah is made a thousand years before Christ will will come. And now we're looking back upon that that Christ event some 2,000 years later and and in and, and all of that, the timeless, perfect Word of God meets us and encounters us and encourages us and fills us with truth. So that we have our Bibles now and they're open, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. And I want us to look in particular, this morning we're going to be looking at verses 2 through 7, but I want to begin by looking at verses 2 through 5. And consider the shocking promises of God. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoiced before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. These are... Incredible promises from God to his people. And and just remember some of the context of this. Remember last week we were looking at Isaiah chapter 7. And and Ahaz is the king in the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom is literally being invaded by their northern brothers. The people of God are involved in civil war. This, when it talks about this people who live or walk in darkness, who dwell in a land of deep darkness, I believe the King James Version say, dwell in the shadow of death. The circumstance in which they're living is no good. And in the middle of, of all this pain, in the middle of all this suffering, come the shocking promises of God. Let, let's enumerate them. There are four promises and I'll try, you know, usually preachers should preach three-point sermons, a little poem, and then we're done, right? So I'm going to go with, with four promises of God, and then we're going to look at the last bit of this text that, that really, I think, turns all these promises on their head. The first promise is this. He will bring light to those dwelling in darkness, This is an an incredible promise of God that that those who are walking in darkness, those who are near the shadow of death, God is going to shine a great light upon them. This is a good thing. This is something that is glorious because I, I don't know if you ever just felt like there was a cloud of darkness over your life. Have you have you ever walked through a season of life where you just felt as though you were wondering where God was, where his hand was, if, if he was really leading you through, as the Psalms say, the valley of the shadow of death, or you were just kind of walking there on your own. The, the shocking promise of God is those people who are walking here who know nothing different, a great light will shine. Not only that, but he's going to bring joy to those who have lost hope. You've multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, verse 3. To be filled with the fullness of joy. This is the promise of God. The third, he will bring freedom from oppression. 
So that these people who feel as though there's nothing they could do right, they're oppressed not only by the darkness, but physical oppression, deliverance is coming. And then verse, the, the fourth promise found in verse 5 is he will bring peace from strife. Every garment rolled in blood, every boot of the trampling warrior is going to be fuel for the fire. Now, these are, are promises of God to his people. Ultimately, I, I think if we were just to stop for a moment, I think we would all say, I would love to experience peace. I, I wish that I had freedom, not just in the terms of I live in, a, in America and a free nation, but truly felt that I had freedom to, to be and embrace life in its fullness. That I was filled with joy. And that I could see the world for all the light that was in there and not all the darkness and the negativity around it. And God is saying to his children, this is what I will do for you. These are good promises. If, if I were Isaiah and I were hearing this message from God, I'd be excited. I, I would be ready to go and declare this good news. I, I would want to tell everyone, guys, hey, we're walking in darkness now. It looks bad, but there's going to be a great light coming. You may feel like all hope is gone, but there is a joy that will satisfy us. You may feel like there's oppression around you, but I'm telling you, God is going to be a bring a freedom that you won't know anything about. And, and if you are longing for peace, all the strife around you will be gone. God is going to do this. Now, now you get a sense now of, of how good news this, how much good news this is. I was wondering, you know, you know what's happening right now? What time is it? 10.48. What's happening right now is all the Oklahoma football fans are anxiously awaiting the next 12 minutes, hoping that somehow I will finish my sermon and they can get the ESPN notification on their phone whether or not they made the playoffs. So... I know what, what's happening here. So in the next 10 minutes, when you diligently look down at your phone and you smile, I know you're not reading the Bible app right then, okay? I, I got this. I'm tracking with you. But even though in the midst of all this distraction, we're beginning to see this is a, an incredible promise from God. And this is a message that Isaiah is saying, I want to take this message. I want to proclaim it. People need to hear this. But if I were Isaiah and I heard this message from the Lord for the first time, there's a point at which, as Isaiah, I would say, God, are you sure about this? These are all incredible promises, but look at verse 6. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. God, are, are, you, are you sure this is a message you want me to bring? I mean, you're, you're, you're standing up and delivering big promises. Light from darkness, joy and hopelessness. Oppression is gone and freedom is present and, and there's going to be peace in the, from, from strife. Are you sure, God, this is right? Isaiah, here's the message. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, what's amazing is I believe when Isaiah speaks this to the people of God, he didn't have those moments where he questioned. 
I, I believe he, he proclaimed this with as much boldness as he did the, the promises of God. And, and that's why I say these are the shocking promises of God. Because light coming into darkness and joy from those who have lost hope and freedom from oppression and peace from strife is all found in the Christ child. It all comes because Jesus came to dwell among us. Now, here, here's just, just, just a moment with me. I, I want you to look at Scripture, and they're, they're going to be on the screen here in just a minute. Because all these promises that God made and said to us, the Son is given, they're fulfilled in Christ. Consider John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is good. This is good news. So to a people who are lost in darkness, walking around, kind of stumbling through life, not knowing exactly where they're going, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Follow me. You'll never walk in darkness again. But do you know what the scriptures say about us? The scriptures describe us as a people who love and enjoy walking in darkness. As a matter of, go, go ahead on to the next slide and then the next scripture in John chapter 3. 19 and 20 says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. So the shocking, amazing promise of God, I'm going to come and I'm going to be light for you. Even the people that saw Jesus. Think about this for a moment. The people who were alive when we're portraying manger scenes, those people who walked where Jesus walked, heard him speak, there were many in those days who did not respond with faith. They loved their darkness rather than light. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But oh, this morning, I, I pray that, that one of the things you'll walk away from this morning is saying, there is light that God has given me to walk in, and it brings me joy. That's the next promise, isn't it? So he will bring joy to those who have lost hope. Look at John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you, that your joy, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. The words of Christ come to us and fill us with joy. Beyond that, when Jesus is speaking, he's talking about having a relationship with him that connects you most fully to the Lord God. And he says, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you receive that your joy may be full. John 16, 24. This is the promise of God fulfilled in Christ. You want a joyful life? Hear the words of Jesus. Dwell upon them. You want joy in your life? Go to the Lord and speak to Him. Ask for Him things in prayer. He fills you with joy. I think perhaps though one of the greatest truths we see is this freedom from oppression. Again, it was the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his pressure. You have broken it as on the day of Midian. Do you, do you remember the day of Midian? Perhaps not. We weren't there, were we? But Gideon was. Remember, and he had amassed this army of 20,000 people. And the Lord said, no, that, that, that's too many people. Uh, you're you're going to get credit for that, not me. So it turns out that the, the, the Midian army is defeated with 600 people with no weapons. They stand on the hill and they have lights and jars. Remember, they break them, they blow their horns, and God causes the Midianites to flee. In, in other words, when God brings deliverance, 
It's on his terms, and he does it his way, and he does it fully and completely. What about Jesus? In John chapter 8, this is what we read about Jesus. Verses 34 through 36, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The reality is every single one of us in this room is born captive to sin, both by nature and by choice. The Bible describes us as slaves. Whether you feel it or not, it is the reality in which we are all born. And this great promise of deliverance comes not through the good things you would do. It's not as though you could live a good life or a great life or you could just be a a godly person and all of a sudden you're free. No, the one the Son sets free is free indeed. And he gets the glory for it. Now just peace for a moment. He'll bring peace from strife. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And we know Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says it very similar. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a peace that Jesus brings that the world cannot give. Now, I want to pause for just a minute because I I want to take you back with me to China. I was there just a few weeks ago, and and I had the joy of of visiting with a a dear friend that I'd met in March. And in March, my dear friend just seemed so piqued in interest in the gospel message. He, He wanted to know more about Jesus. He wanted to know more about Uh, the Bible. He engaged us in meaningful conversation many times. So I was anxious to to meet him again in October, and we sat down, of all things, in a Starbucks. Yes, they have those there too. And we enjoyed a cup of coffee together, and we began talking because he hadn't been to Bible study. He hadn't been around much at all for the last several months. And we began to have a conversation, and this is essentially what he said. Now, these aren't the words he used, but this is the summation of what he was saying. Last semester, I was going through a really rough season in my life, and I was looking for something. But I've kind of got through that now, and I'm okay. Now, I, hear, I heard people visibly say, oh, and ah. But the reality is, I believe that there are many Christians who sit in the church week in and week out who perhaps unknowingly treat Jesus the same way. Well, you know, it's it's been a really rough season. I I ought to go to church. It's been it's been a really rough time. I I, I really should start reading the Bible a little more. I, I should probably pray a little more than I have. It's been tough. Yeah, I know what it's like to walk in darkness. Boy, this has been a tough time, and and I don't have any joy right now. I've lost hope. I really need Jesus. Can Can I tell you something? Those are good things. It's good to recognize your need for Jesus when the circumstances of life are difficult. But there's a reality that's painted here that we need to see and we need to understand. We live in a broken and fallen world. We do. We live in a place that's full of pain and suffering and heartache. We live in a world that's not our eternal home. This isn't what God has for us. We can read books about your best life now, but our best life is yet to come. It's in a place called heaven where God is a portion for those who believe and follow Jesus to be. We can have joy in this life. It's it's approaching the 11 o'clock hour now. Some of you may start getting notifications. There can be joy. 
But I want you to know something. That even the lightest room that we would walk in, even the most incredible joy that we might experience, even the, the best peace that we can manage in this life pales in comparison to the promises of Shocking promises are about a future day because look at, look at this. Of the increase of his government and peace, verse 7, there will be no end. So just imagine for a moment, and I'm picking on the Oklahoma football fans this morning because of the news that's coming out. Imagine that you get the news that your team is going to the playoffs. Great joy. Now imagine that they beat Alabama. Great joy. Now imagine that they win the national championship. Incredible joy. But did you notice what verse 7 said? Think about this for a moment. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Think about the most peaceful place you've ever been, the most tranquility you've experienced in this life. Now just imagine for a moment that that place and that feeling would be multiplied to everyone around you, it would be multiplied among all of creation. Do you see the joy of heaven? Of the increase of his government, that means his reign and his rule. There will be no end. And there will be no end of his peace. Friends, the shocking promise of God comes to us. And the one who can provide the answer to all these things, he's a wonderful counselor. He's a mighty God. He's a prince of peace. He's the everlasting father. I I, I could probably go on for another hour about that, but you probably don't want me to. But let let me just say plainly, these titles that are attributed to the Son, to Jesus, they're the characteristics of who he is. The name given to people in the Old Testament, they were to describe character. So last week we talked about the promise to the, the command to Ahaz. Do you remember? Be quiet. In other words, don't talk about your problems because you can find everybody that will just multiply and make. If you want to go to someone, there's a wonderful counselor whose words are perfect and right. One who's written a book for us that we would know him, love him, be guided in his truth. And that one is the mighty God. Just think of, of Jesus as he dwelt among people, there were some that looked and they said, this is not like any other teacher of the law. He has authority. This man is surely the son of God, said a Roman centurion who watched Jesus die. He, he was the mighty God. The everlasting father means he is a benevolent ruler over all. He's good. The prince of peace establishing the throne of God. Now, The shocking promise is verse 6, a child's born, but the last verse, the last verse is our confidence. Verse 7, that last phrase, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now this word zeal, let me give you a, a word picture of this. This is the context in which it's used, it speaks of jealousy. It's, it's the kind of emotion that would well up in you, women or men, if you walked in and found your spouse in the middle of an affair. And that kind of burning emotion that would come up. Can, can you get a visual picture of that? The zeal of the Lord will do this. Now, here's the picture. God has so much passion for his people to experience true light, true joy, 
true peace, true freedom that he's burning with this zeal and this jealousy when we settle for anything less. When we would settle in our own sin for something to satisfy us, more than that, the zeal of the Lord comes up and says, no, I've got something better for you. I've got something more satisfying for you, a light that shines brighter, a joy that will never fail, a, a, a peace and a, and a freedom that, that are unlike anything you've experienced. And the amazing thing is that the invitation this morning is open for all of us. If we would look to Christ, if we would look to Jesus, we would see that he's the fulfillment of these promises. So I, I would ask you this morning, if, if you've never come to a place where you've confessed your sins before a holy God and said, Lord, there, there's nothing I could do, but I come in all of my brokenness confessing the name of Jesus, that name that is above every, every name. And I ask even in these moments that he would bring me light and peace and freedom and joy. I believe in this very moment God will do that thing for you. But I also believe, Christian, that there are many of you who have tried to walk in light apart from God. You've sought for joy apart from Christ. You've sought for freedom while trying to live in opposition to God and his purposes. And this morning, the invitation is just come back to Christ. Come and experience all the joy and the promises that he gives. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a time to be reminded of your promises. God, thank you that you bring light when we dwell in darkness, that you bring joy when we've lost hope, that you bring freedom from oppression, and that you bring peace from strife. Lord, I, I pray that our eyes would be turned to you. I pray, Father, that our hearts would be drawn to you. Lord, work in us that we might experience these promises in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And, and here's the, the time to respond to God's word. I, I truly believe that the, the most appropriate expression of hearing the word of God preached is to respond and apply it. So the application for some may be what I said a moment ago. You're ready to call upon Jesus as Savior and Lord. Or maybe you have more questions about what that looks like or how you do that. I'm going to be standing here at the front. I would love to pray with you, to encourage you, to answer questions that you may have about that. But the application of the, these truths may be very personal for you. It, it, it may be this morning that, that you're just going to take some time to pray and say, God, I've not been walking in joy. And Lord, I need the joy that you and you alone can provide. Or, or maybe it's freedom. Maybe there's been sin that's just been heavy on your heart. And, and you recognize more appreciably than some what Jesus said. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. And in this moment, you're ready to say, God, I, I need to experience your freedom. I, I'm ready to turn from sin and turn to you because... I believe you can set me free indeed. Would you respond to Jesus and ask him to fulfill these promises in your life? Let's stand together and sing. Respond to God in this world.